I actually designed to talk about uh, around my own research, but also uh, kind of in tandem with what the kind of the subject seemed to me of the conference. Uh, so that was experiential environment. So here you have just a, my website. If you're interested, most of the slides are always on there. Not this yet, but I will upload it somewhere under presentations. Um, so I'm not just, sorry, I need some more light. Uh, I'm not just a, an artist, or actually I'm not an, only an artist, because artists are uh, one of the most important creatures in this world, especially right now, I think. I've also been curating and uh, researching. I'm right now teaching new media uh, in Kassel, in Germany. Um, this is a festival. Yes, I used to work with Glitch. I would say now I'm more into resolutions. I'm trying to kind of pivot away from just the Glitch because the Glitch is like maybe too old to keep researching somehow, or there's always new Glitches, but you know, there's enough books now. I am done. <laughs> Uh, so this was a festival I was organizing with a few other bots. We called uh, ourselves bots to kind of not call ourselves curators because that puts you kind of like in the position of, you know, imposing particular perspectives and we wanted to have more of an open framework. I thought that was an interesting kind of start for this because, yeah, that kind of has this like, um, this freedom for how to create an experiential space in terms of a festival. Another thing I was part of was Dark Ecology, which is a three years research kind of trip to um, uh, the, the polar regions uh, around uh, Norway and uh, Russia. And uh, to, to me, this is one of the most interesting experiential uh, festivals or events or research trips, whatever you want to call it, because you know, you're really in a space that is super mega brutal. For the people that are uh, aware of, for instance, um, Morton's Dark Ecology book, you're really in the dark ecology. Now, I will not go into that more, but I wanted to introduce also like how I feel like I connect maybe from another side than art, artist work. So this is an old thing that I've been talking about a lot, but I think it's really important here, especially also with the hexadome for me, my perspective in what screens are. Screens are not just this thing that you sit in front of and that, you know, put stuff on you. It's also a filter for any kind of content. And I experienced that a lot during my performance in Moscow in 2013, when I was doing a live performance. And everybody that does live performance, or that does live video generation, knows that it's important to really be live. Otherwise, you lose the beat or, you know, the rhythm. And it wasn't possible because I, I mean, my interpretation is I came from the Netherlands. It is, was just during the new LG, they, then it was just LG, oh Jesus. The ban on uh, any kind of um, same sex or uh, transgressive for them, uh, they called it propaganda. So there's this whole like um, ban on this and they were afraid of me uh, being political in this, in this setting. And, you know, we had a lot of talks about it. I, I, I wanted to, but I don't want to go to Kulak, so uh, I didn't. But I did get the Russian police on my tail, or I would call it the Russian video police, because they put a, a guy that, that put a delay on my video. And so my whole performance was horrible, because I could not get on. You know, I cannot be five seconds in the future to come, you know, with my projection live. And so uh, what I realized in this case is like, yeah, there is a thickness in the screen. It's like the audience will only see what they see on the screen. They will not see the production on the video. And that was for me very important. Uh, another important thing that I learned uh, was from going to Hilila, for those who are not aware of Hilila, it's an artist, um, surrealist garden in Mexico. And when I was there, I was very confused about kind of like how to navigate this space. And then I thought, okay, what I should really do is learn from this. I should learn what is architecture. Normally architecture is a way, you know, to organize the flow. But actually what I want is maybe to learn how to deregulate the flow, to see how to build videos that are maybe not always that organized, like how the Russian video police organized my videos, for instance. So I build a video, um, performance tool, let's say, in which I would put videos in 3D space as textures, and then I could kind of escape this quadrilateral image uh, of normal video. And I presented it, and I, like all my work, I put it on the internet, 
and I got a beautiful review. <laughs> because, you know, I put it in a 3D environment, so it was a video game. I didn't think about that. So uh, I learned that every time you put something in a wrapper, that wrapper kind of imposes the reading. So I had all these like learning moments. And then I thought, OK, there's these hierarchies of how to read stuff. And you cannot really get away from them. You're always, always stuck in the hierarchies. So that's how my research uh, developed into what are resolutions. Resolutions are the way we read stuff. But there are also compromises on how we're not reading other stuff. And so that's where I really pivoted away from glitches. I think it's very important to talk about what these compromises are. And that is in terms of all kinds of levels of our content as artists, as producers, as software developers. So just going back to the screen for a moment, I thought it would be the best subject to tackle here. This is a beautiful definition of the screen. It's um, written by the Finnish researcher uh, Erki Hutamo. I like to read it out loud. In spite of their ubiquitous presence, screens are strangely evasive. They are hard to grasp. They are constantly metamorphosing, appearing in new places and in new forms. They're big screens, they're small screens. Some are flat, some are fat. Some are attached to a box. Some are like the sun. They're active, they're radiating, and they have a life of their own. While others are like the moon. They're passive, they're reflecting light projected at them. There are screens observed from a distance, and others are touched and interacted with, held in one's hand. But how to formulate a definition that would embrace them all? Does it even make sense to ask that question? Well, I will not completely answer this, but I do think there is something to take away from this talk. Um, another research I've been doing is uh, into compressions. That's kind of coming from my research into Glitch. Um, this is a VR environment I built, it's DCT siphoning. DCT, for those who are not familiar with DCT, is like the building brick of the JPEG. So the most used image compression in the world ever. It's kind of like really resting on this one algorithm, which is called DCT, discrete cosine transform. And in this particular environment, I wanted to kind of explain a story of the imposition of uh, compressions and what is not compressed and what cannot be read. read. So through a story of uh, a big block and a small block who both go through these different kinds of layers of compression, or I call them compression complexities. So from like the pixels to the lines, and from the lines to the blocks, and then they move to the wavelets and to vector space. And at some point the blocks go crazy because they are not from vector space. So that's where they quit. Um, yeah. And then I started to project this not just in VR, because I'm still fighting to get away from you know, the quadrilateral screen, uh, uh, into this, uh, I called it a spomanique. This is like a screen that has different angles. And um, yeah, we called them a shards. So I had a lot of shards in space projecting different kinds of VR. Behind the screen, you could do the VR. And it was a part that was like live projected. And so uh, I tried to kind of break up this like experience of what is VR. Um, next to the next chapter, this is a beautiful image, by the way, but uh, it's from Batman, an old Batman. Unlearned and designed habits of perception. So I started to really ask myself, what is a screen? Or I was actually asked at some point, like, what is the future of the screen? And I'm not really like a future teller, but I can try. So I started to, to ask Google first. Um, for, for Google, it's blue, and it has weird, <laughs> Um, it has like weird organizations of the data. Like, I mean, there, I have no idea who would be able to read this. Um, then I thought, okay, maybe a better way is to start doing research into screens from sci-fi movies. So I started to watch all the trailers in the internet movie database of the last 25 years, the 20 that had the most um, box office success. Because I feel like if we're talking about the future of the screen. It's about how a language of what a screen is being made, and there must be some kind of reference there. Um, and what I found was Lilo and Stitch. Um, I found, I'm just showing some of my favorite screens. This is Spy Kids 2. Uh, this is a woman who is um, writing to the uh, to this, uh, information agency through her lipstick keyboard. Um, this is the man in black. Here we see in the, 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 the sci-fi screens, we're actually getting away from the quadrilateral screen. It's amazing. These are all rounds. OK, 
Kingsman. This is uh, an umbrella screen, and it kind of like protects you from the stuff, while it also gives you metadata on your environment. <laughs> oh, yeah, here we have Minority Report. Obviously, it's blue. Um, they're in, uh, in the sci-fi uh, life in the future. And, and this is how you enter. <laughs> Very nice, Star Wars has also uh, holograms and uh, it's because they are going, I believe there was like a, I, I tried to understand why it had noise, but it was because they were going through a galaxy, so it had to have some noise, analog noise. This is Prometheus. Wow, they're all blue, what's happening? <laughs> Wing Commander, he has got augmented reality classes. Oh yeah, this I like because in uh, Ghost of the Shell, we're kind of putting the screen in our brain, so. Um, this is a beautiful, uh, Spy Kids are actually the best. This is like six levels of augmented reality, like stacked AR or something, I don't know. So here you have it, you can find it under uh, under uh, the Beyond Resolution Info uh, website, but I. I got all the uh, screens, all the images, and all the noise, and I tried to describe it. So what can this actually teach us about the future of the screen? Well, um, it teaches us that the future is basically blue. <laughs> uh, and I didn't, I, there's more to that, but you can read it in the paper. But what I, uh, what I liked uh, when I started to think, like, why, where does this come from? I, I found this guy, um, or it's actually two people, Nathan Sh Shedrov and Christopher Nussel. They might be from here, actually, but I don't know them. So, uh, But they were actually asking the same questions. And to them, there was a reason for that. Um, it's uh, because of the tungsten light, and it's uh, just an easier way to change the colors in, uh, you know, color change after the film is shot. So there's a very practical reason why the future is blue. It's quite boring. It's about lightening of the now. Um, so uh, I'm, if, this is Wendy Chun. She wrote a beautiful book, Updating to Remain the Same, and it's about habitual practices. So I'm going to make a little bit of a sharp break, but it's for a reason. It's about the suspension of belief. I believe we have, um, we always believed in the suspension of disbelief, but at this point in time, especially here in the US, but actually the whole world is borrowing their politics and their ways of language from the US, if they're not intelligent enough. Um, so we are living in a time in which there is no such thing anymore as believing in reality or truth. Everything is like double guessed. Everything is like decontextualized and um, no longer very truthful, let's say. I think you know exactly what I mean. Um, which is interesting. Um, what I did here, it's a joke, a US joke. This is like um, the harm to ongoing matter. If you remember this Mueller report that was just completely uh, the black flag of um, your country somehow. Um, I put the, um, sorry. I, I, I live with a Mexican, so we get to hate on US every day. <laughs> um, too much information, but it's the truth. Uh, so here we have a black hole on the Mueller report. This is uh, in between those dates. Uh, the Netherlands actually started the, um, the World Press photo in 1955, but I believe it's now a very universal or a very uh, earthly thing, like it's everywhere. This photo won um, the World Press photo, which is very important that this photo won. But what I wanted to point out, which I think is like me making fun of my own country, because I get to do that after I made fun of your country. Um, this is uh, one of the rules of the uh, World Press photo is, uh, what are the rules of making a, they don't use the word real, but like what counts as a World Press photo. For instance, you cannot change your colors. Now, look at this photo. Well, it's not, now it's like completely edited, but the photo of the black hole, I would say that's a photo. Most people, but it's taken even through all kinds of lenses, but this would never be allowed to send into the World Press photo. I think this shattered our ideas of what um, the world and our universe could be. Um, so this was taken on the 10th of April. This image won on the 11th of April. Of course, there's no real connection to them at all, but I just wanted to um, 
kind of point out that everything we understand about our media, our archetypes, our photography, screens, video, sci-fi, um, they're all stuck in these like very small defined boxes. So this is not a photo, but this is obviously, yes, it's a very important photo and image. Um, okay, we're going to back to VR. Um, I just wanted to pull this up and not give any comments on it because uh, I wanted to actually comment on this. So this is a VR experience about how to cross the border. It was uh, brought up yesterday. So how to feel like an immigrant going through the um, desert. And um, this is, uh, Chris Milky might also be from this region, you know, just staying close to the trouble. Um, he, uh, he wrote, he, he was in 2015 one of the important dudes to talk about VR and he called it the ultimate empathy machine. I just wanted to stress, since I'm here, empathy is nothing if we don't know, uh, if we don't have compassion, sympathy, morality, ethics, if we don't act. So I just wondered how much this really makes people act. Like, you know, that's, a, a, a pro, that's an important thing problem. And then I started to look at his work and actually I found it very, very striking is a good word, uh, that he's working for the United um, Nations VR, um, he's making 360 videos VR. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the first three uh, iterations they had actually were following young girls in problematic regions and that's the ultimate empathy machine. Do you know, like, do you see where I'm getting, it's a little bit exploitative. I thought like, can you also have empathy without young girls? Um, so, <laughs> we, we all know this, but you know, I had to put it in there. So, what's happening is, I feel like, um, and that's actually where I wanted to kind of put the conclusion, like how do you really make something immersive or experiential, like how can you make people really more than just having that empathy or that moment of unch, and then they go on to their normal business. For me, that is not about watching, um, you know, a, a sad story about a young girl or uh, whatever. For me, it's to make your audience really question something or make them want to understand but be a little bit worried if they do understand because that makes them really think longer. So I'm kind of in favor of creating these spaces that are double. So I'm referencing a double think here but then a double space, a space that has multiple interpretation. Maybe it's a love letter, or maybe it's just somebody just died. You know, like, um, that's, that's like, for me, this moment when people are just thinking, what is going on? So I've been trying to think in what these things could be, and I got into the desktop genre. So these are like videos that are happening, uh, or artworks that are taking place just on the desktop to construct this kind of like, uniformal space that we have right here that we're using on a daily basis. I think the future of the desktop genre is actually gone because nobody uses computers anymore, especially if you go to Japan, people just use phones. So maybe it's like the screen of the system on a chip or I, I don't know, whatever. Um, but so for me, the work that I um, made uh, is Behind White Shadows is uh, the newest work I made, which I would say maybe it's, but that's a joke, but maybe it's also a double space. So what I uh, have been doing research uh, in, too, is um, white shadows, which are basically, um, to me, the women that have been at the basis of image processing but never have been really shown. Um, you know, Lena is, for instance, the test, color test card of JPEG algorithm. So she's the only color test card of the JPEG algorithm. That also means, by the way, that there might be a, a better JPEG algorithm if we would have tested in other people of color, for instance. But anyway, um, so I made this desktop in which all these women, because there is so many of them that were the color or the test cards or the reference cards for all our technologies ever, still, um, and made them give some comments about how it is to be a color test card. And um, to me, that's kind of a, yeah, one way to deal with this and make it um, a double space or a space that is kind of funny but is actually really terrible. So um, I wanted to leave it at that. Thank you very much.